Howdy, fellow soldiers. Thanks for tuning in. After last week's hot topic, hot topic. I wasn't sure any of you would be back. And I'm glad you are. I'm glad that you've been following along in this series. And today we're going to hear from you as we crack open the mailbag digitally. And I address your comments, questions, and feedback. I'm Pastor Shane, and I'll be your mailman today as we appropriate some culture. We've covered some touchy issues on this program, and some of the comments will reflect that, so parental warning is advised. So with that said, let's dive into the old mailbag. Our hot topic, hot topic on Pride Month generated some heated conversations. One Facebook commentator opined, I do agree that some companies use Pride Month as a way of increasing business, but I do not think that there's anything idiotic about this month in the slightest. Now, first of all, I didn't say that the month is idiotic. I said that the notion that the LGBTQ movement is an expression of an oppressed minority is idiotic because it's supported by all major institutions and levers of power from corporate America to big tech to Hollywood to academia to government. They continue, Pride Month is to celebrate a group of people who have been oppressed since forever. The month of June is not random. June is Pride Month because of the Stonewall riots that took place in 1969. Nobody said it was random, but why a month? The Stonewall riots didn't last a month. Now, I do agree that homosexuals have been mistreated and persecuted in history, but not uniquely. Virtually every group has been mistreated or persecuted in history. Jews, Christians, Muslims, Blacks, the Irish, the Chinese, Koreans, Native Americans, Armenians, Japanese. Human beings are sinful, and human history is one long display of one group of humans mistreating another. In fact, looking at it through the long view of history, homosexuals have relatively been unscathed. The notion that they've been persecuted since forever uh, simply isn't true. Don't believe me? Uh, here's this from Wikipedia, no less. Roman men were free to enjoy sex with other males without a perceived loss of masculinity or social status. And the same was true in Greek culture. So while Christians were being fed to lions for sport and burned alive to light chariot races, gay Romans were doing gay things without any repercussions. They particularly liked the young boys, 12 to 14 range, which I would speak out against, but I don't want to be hateful. And after all, love is love. Homosexuals have not been uniquely oppressed in human history, and if it's about oppression, uh, then where's the love for the Jews? I mean, they've been oppressed throughout all of human history, including modern history, and here in this country. In fact, according to FBI crime statistics, Jews are at least three times more likely to experience a hate crime in America than any other ethnic group. Consistently, Jews top the charts as victims of hate crimes in this country. If Pride Month is really about tolerance and the oppression of a people, then why don't the Jews get a month? or even a day. And corporate America doesn't say anything about it. Big tech doesn't say anything about it. Nick Jr. doesn't say anything about it. Our government doesn't fly Israeli flags at all of our embassies. Maybe Pride Month isn't simply about tolerance and oppression. What could it be about? Take it away, San Francisco gay men's choir. You think that we'll corrupt your kids if our agenda goes unchecked? Funny, just this once, you're correct. We'll convert your children Happens bit by bit Quietly and subtly And you will barely notice it You can keep them from disco Warn about San Francisco Make them wear pleated pants, we don't care We'll convert your children that's catchy. Our commentator concludes, we honor those who bravely love who they love despite the harsh people in this world. Again, as I laid out, the LGBTQ view is the dominant ideology of our culture. Standing up and espousing the same position that all of our corporations and all big tech and all of Hollywood and academia and our government says isn't bravery, that's conformity. Now that doesn't mean that we have to be contrarian, but if I were to stand up and say, listen, I'm against cancer. That's not a brave statement or deserving of a slow clap because it's the dominant view. Next comment. Pastor Governor Shane has a nice ring to it. We need someone to bring morals back into our society. Want to run? I only run when chase, and the only title I'm after is Ultimate Benevolent Dictator. Next comment. Shane, is there an elephant in this room? Thought for sure you would address King David. 
Don't say elephant, it gets you in trouble. But great question though. This is in response to our hot topic, hot topic on the death penalty. The context of this comment is in regard to King David who sets up Uriah to be killed so that he can cover for the fact that he slept with Uriah's wife. So the issue is essentially, David committed this heinous act and yet he wasn't put to death. Which is interesting, but I don't think that this passage of scripture really informs us on whether or not we should have the death penalty. Uh, first of all, it's descriptive, it's not prescriptive, which means it tells us what happened, but it's not telling us what we ought to do. It's not prescriptive. And it's not really a good argument against the death penalty because if the suggestion is we shouldn't put to death murderers because David was a murderer and he wasn't put to death, that's true. But David also spent zero days in prison. So does that therefore mean that we shouldn't incarcerate murderers? And that logic won't hold. And in the passage, David acknowledges that he deserves death. Nathan the prophet sets him up. He tells him a story which is analogous to what David did. And then it says, David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. And Nathan the prophet says, You're the man. And God brings judgment on David, both for the adultery. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you. And he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. And there's also judgment for the murderer. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But because by doing this, you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. So even in this case, the death penalty is enacted, though it's carried out against the son and not David, which poses interesting theological questions about God's justice, but it really has no bearing on whether or not we ought to have the death penalty. Next comment. Thanks, Pastor Shane. Awesome biblical explanation. Flame emoji. Thank you. I appreciate the encouragement. Next comment. Dear Pastor Shane, nobody likes you. They all say so. Your books are dumb. Nobody buys them. It's embarrassing. You're embarrassing. And you have a silly beard. T. Brady. T. Brady. Next comment. Thanks, Shane. We have enjoyed watching The Chosen series. The quality of acting and production is great. I've only seen clips of the show and a lot of behind the scenes stuff because fun fact, the creator of the show is Dallas Jenkins, the son of Jerry B. Jenkins from the Left Behind series. And I'm actually Facebook friends with Dallas. He sent me a friend request after liking the way I conducted myself when I was in an argument with Scott Derrickson, the director of Doctor Strange. Now I do have some qualms with Dallas in terms of mission and artistic choices, but I love that he's engaging in the medium and I think more and more Christians and church as ought to, and I think we should support people like him as much as we can. Next comment. I know you have experience in media, so a movie might be in your near future. Well, I have made a movie, and I certainly plan to again, so who knows? A movie might be in your future too. Next comment. Is there a difference between feasting and gluttony? Yeah, there does seem to be an element of excess in jubilant celebrations, right? My cup overflows. And there's lots of feasting imagery and examples in scripture. So I don't think isolated moments of overindulgence is a problem. I think we probably all overeat on Thanksgiving. Again, it comes back to the principle of moderation. Vacationing and resting at times doesn't make you lazy or slothful. There's a season for everything. And so too, feasting and overindulging on occasion in celebration doesn't make you a slave to food. And I think that's really the central question. Are you being mastered by something? But let's think about this. If eating to excess is sometimes permissible, is drinking in excess in celebration also permissible at times? Because the same line of reasoning could apply. My cup overflows indeed. So maybe it is always wrong to overeat and we need to rethink our behavior at Thanksgiving. Or maybe exuberant drinking is not the same as drunkenness, which is habitual. Ponder that one. Let me know what you think. Next comment. Be better, smell better. Is that directed at me? Next comment. You're too flippant. I think G.K. Chesterton said it best. It's the test of a good religion, whether you can joke about it. Next comment. I understand what you mean that we have to be good consumers in order to be good producers, but I really can't stand to watch any of the modern stuff on TV. 
Well, you don't have to and don't violate your conscience. But my encouragement would be to find some way in which you can take steps to impact the culture, particularly when it comes to media, because the entertainment industry is the primary driver of the culture. And if we want to change what we're seeing coming out of the entertainment industry, then we need to participate in it. And the point I was making is that it's really impossible to be good producers of that content if we're not good consumers of it. That doesn't mean you have to be the person to do that, but it does mean we ought to support the endeavor and not look so judgmentally on fellow Christians who are engaging with the culture on that level. Well, that'll do for now. Thanks for your comments and questions and feedback and for supporting this. Keep them coming, please. And as always, you can reach me on Facebook, Twitter, and Locals, and I'll see you next week for more Appropriating the Culture.